When we think about effective altruism and doing the most good in the world that we can, our focus has historically been on philanthropy, charitable giving, where can we make the most impact with our dollars, and also where can we make the most impact with our careers. But government, of course, is one of the biggest levers in the world. And as the effective altruism movement grows and matures, it certainly makes sense for us to try to understand how we, we can apply the same evidence-based, impartial mindset that we bring to philanthropy to the world of policy. This is really a new research area for the effective altruism movement. And for that reason, I'm really excited to introduce this panel of guests who have experience in government and in the think tank space to help us understand it better. I'm going to have the pleasure of moderating myself, so I've just got four panelists to introduce, beginning with Jenya Dana. You heard from her yesterday in a Q&A session. She is a senior science policy officer in the office of the science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. She advises on emerging biotechnologies and international policy issues, and she's a negotiator on science, technology, and innovation in multilateral organizations such as the United Nations. She also works on advanced science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development with a focus on Africa. Please welcome Jenya Dana. Next up is Seb Farquhar. Seb joined the Center for Effective Altruism to establish the Global Priorities Project, having previously worked as a management consultant at McKinsey, where he focused on public and social sector work. Before that, he was on the founding team of 80,000 Hours and wrote the world's first statement on what effective altruism is. Seb has a master's degree in physics and philosophy from Oxford. Please welcome Seb Farquhar. Tom Khalil is next. He's a deputy director for technology and innovation for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and senior advisor for science, technology, and innovation for the National Economic Council. In, from the 2001 to 2008, he was also special assistant to the Chancellor for Science and Technology at UC Berkeley, where he developed the Big Ideas at Berkeley program, which provided support for multi multidisciplinary teams here at Berkeley who were interested in addressing economic and social challenges, such as clean energy, safe drinking water, and poverty alleviation. Please welcome Tom Khalil. And finally, Rajesh Murtanjani is a senior director of communication and policy outreach at the Center for Global Development, a policy research, research organization based in DC and London that works to reduce global poverty and inequality through independent research, practical policy ideas, and creative engagement. Prior to that, he spent more than 20 years at the BBC, mainly as a news correspondent and anchor reporting from around the globe. Please welcome Rajesh Merchandani. All right, so it's great to have all of you guys here. As I mentioned in the opening remarks, policy is a relatively new area for effective altruism. I think it's a relatively new area for a lot of people in the audience today. So I thought we could start by just going down the line here and kind of sharing what it is that each of you do, the role in this broader policy enterprise, and how you see yourself sort of situated in this massive project of essentially making the rules of our societies. Do you want to start? go first? Okay. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so the Center for Global Development, as you rightly described, is a policy research organization. We're a think tank. Uh, and we look at the problems in the world. We focus entirely on international development. But we look at the problems that the world faces through the lens of how can the policies of governments in rich countries and powerful institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, for example, how can those be tweaked so that they don't necessarily penalize the likes of you and me, but they make a big difference for people in the developing world. We look for the win-win. Now, if that all seems a little bit mysterious and a bit difficult to understand, that's exactly what I thought too when I started here 18 months ago. I'd come from the world of journalism, as Nathan said, and as a journalist, you look at policy uh, as something of a kind of wall. And you think of you know, policy being made in back rooms and dark chambers and horse traded amongst people with vested interests. Uh, and then I came to CGD, and you realize that it's actually nothing of the sort, as my colleagues will, I'm sure, talk a little bit, about, uh, talk a little bit more about. Um, for us, we start by identifying uh, a problem that we perceive in the world. Why aren't children in developing countries actually learning when they go to school, for example? That's something we're working on right now. Um, and then because we're a bunch of economists, we look at the numbers, we look at data, and we analyze what the problems are 
and why certain policies may not be working and the results of certain policies. And from those, we draw our conclusions. So uh, I'm sure you'll talk a bit more about this later on, but in terms of evidence, which is something that I'm sure all of you are interested in, it's central to what we do. So uh, I'm hoping that that will start to demystify slightly a little bit about what we do and how it fits into the effective altruism idea. Uh, so, I work for two different parts of the White House, the National Economic Council, which is responsible for the coordination of domestic and international economic policy, and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and for OSTP, I lead a team of about 20 policy entrepreneurs within the White House uh, who are asking a really broad range of questions. Uh, so one example is, in the same way that President Kennedy said, let's put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, and we decided to sequence the human genome and drive down the cost of doing that from 100 million to 1,000. What are the similarly ambitious goals that we should be setting uh, in the 21st century? Or uh, what is the uh, future of human space exploration or the growth of the commercial space industry? Or what would it mean to make uh, computer science a new basic at the K through 12 level? So right now, uh, only 10% of, of schools are offering computer science. What could we do about that? Um, and so once we've identified an area that uh, we think should be a priority or the president has said, you know, I want you to focus on this particular issue, then policy is about trying to create a coherent relationship between ends and means. That is, you have some goal that you're trying to achieve uh, and you believe that there is some set of public and private actions that you will think will move us uh, in the right direction. And that could be pursued through uh, working with Congress on legislation, uh, uh, the preparation of the president's budget, if it's something that would require additional investment in, in research and development, for example, or identifying things that agencies can already do through executive action, uh, or using the president's bully pulpit to bring together coalitions, not just of uh, federal government agencies, but also companies, research universities, philanthropists and foundations, nonprofit organizations, uh, states, cities, that, that type of thing. Um, so that's what we do, is we, we're exposed to lots of ideas. Uh, some fraction of the time we decide, yes, that's an important issue, and then we try to figure out what are the public and private actions that will move us in the right direction. So one thought experiment that I pose to the mem members of my team is to imagine that you have a magic laptop. Uh, and the power of the laptop is that any press release that you write will come true. Uh, and you have to come up with a headline that is a goal statement, several paragraphs to provide context, and paragraph level descriptions of who is agreeing to do what in order to achieve the goal in the form A does B, so C. So some individual organization takes some action in the pursuit of some goal. Um, so I'd be delighted to give you some uh, case studies of, of, of how we go from idea to something uh, actually happening in the, in the world as uh, we move forward with this discussion. Sounds great. Seth? So in my work at the Global Priorities Project at the Center for Effective Altruism, the work splits primarily into a responsive and a proactive component. So on the responsive half, we develop frameworks over time that we can then use to apply to questions that are asked to us by policymakers. So this might be thinking about good ways to measure benefits over time and adjust this for risk and so on. And this is just a way to help policymakers be more reflective in answering the questions that they're addressing in any event. And on a more proactive component, we see our job as um, filtering the space of policy ideas, drawing heavily on academics who are uh, subject matter specialists, and gradually evaluating and fleshing those out in more detail. So we've been focusing to a large degree on global catastrophic risks as a policy area, which is highly interdisciplinary. It's not something where any one individual is likely to have all of the answers. You know, you need people who are expert in international law, people who are expert in the scientific disciplines. And what this means is that, that we believe the best approach is to host workshops where people from a broad range of disciplines are able to give some input into potential solutions to problems. 
and to sort of gradually flesh out the um, brainstorming that happens in that process, drawing on more input from subject matter specialists throughout that process until we get to a short list of things that seem really quite likely to be productive and also plausibly implementable, and then to engage with policymakers in the process of getting those ideas circulating uh, with an intention that sometime down the line they are actually implemented. Jenny? So the office that I work for within the State Department, which is essentially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the United States, is the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State. And this agency, the State Department, is about 35,000 people. We are the foreign policy sort of diplomatic machinery of the United States. And I think sometimes people are surprised to learn that there is a science advisor within the State Department as a foreign policy institution. And indeed, there are over 300 PhD trained scientists and engineers within this foreign policy institution. Our office, the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor, is small. We're about eight people. We were formed in 2000 under Secretary of State Malin Albright in response to a National Academy of Sciences study that looked at the breadth of issues, foreign policy issues, that have a science and tech and innovation component to it, whether you're looking at global health pandemics and how to respond, um, how to understand climate change and come to global agreements on what to do, uh, how to deal with nuclear weapons and nonproliferation issues. These are all technical issues, but they're also diplomatic issues. So that was one of the reasons that there was a recommendation, that was the main reason there was a recommendation that there should be a science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. What we do in our office is uh, three things. One, we try to build that technical capacity of the department and understanding that about half of our people are actually out overseas in the embassies and the missions ac around the world. Those are, that's our diplomatic core out there um, doing really some of the, the deep geopolitical work. Um, we run four fellowship programs in my office, bringing in trained scientists and engineers to the department, which is how I entered the State Department myself. We also look at ways to use science and technology as a tool for diplomacy. Oftentimes when relationships are strained between countries, the scientists are working together and they're having conversations and, and those ties between countries are, are strong at that level. And so that's one, we call it sort of the third track of diplomacy happening between the scientific communities in different countries. Um, and we try to uh, utilize those avenues of conversation um, and uh, consider that part of our diplomatic engagement. Um, and then the third thing we do is we monitor and, and advise on emerging science and technology trends that will have impacts on foreign policy. So we try to keep abreast of things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, gene editing, um, robotics, and we are in the position of flagging up our chain of command and explaining what some of these, these emerging trends are, the technical details of them, and then why they may matter for our diplomatic engagements. Well, thank you all for that. Uh, so much breadth, obviously, on this panel. And one thing that sort of struck me as I was listening to each of you describe your role is, well, it starts at a very high level of big questions, right? Um, thinking back to yesterday, we had a discussion here about evidence and reproducibility of science. So I wonder how you guys feel in your work about the information that you're working with as you get started on a project. And I would imagine in the policy arena, it's even a little more challenging because people are coming to you with motivations, right? And they've got, they've got their study, but they've also got their agenda. So how solid do you feel the information is that you're working with as you begin to open up some of these big questions? 
me? Yeah, any, okay. any, don't, don't all volunteer at once. Um, so we're often the people who go to uh, uh, people like Tom and Jenya with the papers. We're the ones who write the papers. Um, and the way we start is that we, or how we should, this is how it should work, um, we identify a problem in the world and we think, okay, can we bring anything to that? And because we are a bunch of economists, uh, our comparative advantage is to look at the numbers, to look at the data and see, okay, what's not working, what's working here? Um, and so we'll use publicly available data sets or in some instances we'll reach out to other people who have data to get their data sets and we'll study the numbers. And the way that then the number, what we find in the numbers is what informs our results and then our conclusions and the policy recommendations that come out of that. And when we're making policy recommendations, we're looking at the numbers and it's, less, it's taking us down a certain path and then it's about applying your political savvy and speaking to other experts in that field about, okay, what is going to be a viable policy here? Because one thing about policy that you want to do is that you don't want to go out there and you know, go to Tom or go to Jenny or go to uh, uh, members of Congress and say, okay, you need to ban all cars because it's clearly not gonna happen. You've gotta be a little bit more sensitive to reality about making policy work. So we try and find a sweet spot for people that come at the problem from different perspectives. Let me give you a, an example to kind of clarify that. So there's an issue when it comes to very reasonable policies that are in place to counter the illicit transfer of money across borders. Uh, it's called anti-money laundering combating the financing of terrorism legislation. And it's designed to stop people funding uh, uh, jihadi organizations, for example. Um, very reasonable national security justification for that. But there's an unintended consequence of that. And that is that there are stiff penalties for any banks that cannot track who the final customer of any money is that they help transfer across borders. And so banks, faced with the potential of these massive fines are actually pulling out of entire countries. So currently, I believe, there is no major American or British bank that will do business with any organizations helping to transfer money to Somalia. Uh, why are money transfers important? Because remittances, which is people who've left their country to work overseas sending money home, dwarf foreign aid. So foreign aid is about $150 billion, $160 billion every year. Remittances are three times that amount of money. It's massively, massively important for development, and that's what we are interested in. But if people can't send money home legitimately, then that's going to massively impact their families in those countries that are depending on that money. So that's the real world problem that we started out with. We thought, okay, what's the problem here? You can't come at that from saying to um, the US government, you need to take down these AML CFT, anti-money laundering, combating the financing of terrorism legislation. You can't do that because it's not going to fly. So you have to bear that in mind and be a little more politically savvy about it. So what you do is that you get all the stakeholders. You get the money transfer organizations like Western Union. You get the banks who are the ones facing the regulations. You get the regulators involved and you get experts like I have, economics experts who are the academics essentially, who've studied the data and what does the data show, the scale of the problem and where are the problems most acute. And you sit down then, you've got the data so you've worked out where the problems are most acute and where the opportunities are, and between you, you figure out something that's actually gonna be a sweet spot for policy. And that's what we did with a report that we put out last year. That's gained traction with the Fed, with uh, Congress and with the Bank of England. Our next hope is that some of those recommendations will go into actual policy change and have a real world impact which should start countering those unintended consequences. So I wanted to talk about an intellectual movement that I think actually has a fair amount of overlap and, and synergy with the EA movement and that is the, an interest in evidence-based policy. Um, and the goal of evidence-based policy is to use evidence where it exists and to build it where it doesn't. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of, of how this is actually getting instantiated. So one is this notion of tiered evidence funding, um, which provides small grants for new ideas worth trying, medium-sized grants to validate promising approaches with a uh, either experimental or quasi-experimental evaluation, 
and then large grants to scale things up that have not only demonstrated to work, but are viewed as cost effective in terms of the outcome per dollar. So uh, uh, under the Obama administration and with some bipartisan support from the Congress, more funding is being shifted in that direction. So I think the other thing uh, that's important to do is, is how can you make the federal government and the country and you know, the world as, as a whole a learning organization, an organization that is engaging in learning, that is uh, engaging in experimentation. Five or ten years from now, our understanding of how to solve a particular problem is has been advanced. Um, a second one that I would uh, point to is an increased interest in paying for outcomes as opposed to paying for inputs. Um, so there are uh, ideas, uh, one idea that the British government came up with is this notion of a social impact bond. Uh, I've done some work with Congress to pass legislation that gives every agency the authority to support incentive prizes for up to $50 million. Uh, Rajesh's organization did a lot of work on the notion of advanced market commitments. Five countries and the Gates Foundation went to pharmaceutical companies and said, if you develop a vaccine which is safe and effective, then we will buy X million doses at $7 a dose. And that one intervention eliminated the usual 15-year gap between when a vaccine is available in North America and Europe and when it's available in, in low-income developing countries. So those are two approaches that I think are really effective. One is uh, using evidence where it exists and building it where it doesn't. And the other is trying to figure out how governments and uh, philanthropists and foundations, for that matter, can move towards uh, paying for outcomes as opposed to paying for inputs meta level effort right it's not a not a particular domain right this is something that can apply yeah across this is so, so for areas. example we have a program uh, in USAID uh, called development innovation ventures there's now uh, an international version of this program and again the idea is that if you have a good idea you get a little bit of money uh, if it, it generates some promising results, then you should get the funding to rigorously evaluate that. And if you've got something that works, we should be figuring out how to scale it up. So it's a, it's a principle of governance that can be applied in, in lots of different areas. So that approach is being used in USAID, in the Department of Education, and the Corporation for National Community Service, in the Department of Labor, uh, lots of different agencies. Could I just... Uh just added something to what Tom said about this, this, the importance of paying for outcomes rather than inputs. This is massively important in development. Um, paying for inputs is paying for things like building schools in developing countries, for example, to choose the education example. And you think, oh, that's a great thing. That's going to help people learn. But the, all the evidence shows that actually it doesn't. Uh, so then you say, okay, well, should we pay for outputs? What do we pay for? We pay for school enrollment. More those schools. Great, yeah. And actually, you know, through the Millennium Development Goals process of the last 15 years, school enrollment at, I think, primary age is now almost at 100% around the world. Fantastic achievement. But the evidence shows that kids are leaving those schools still not having learned. So you're not paying for the outcome. You're paying for the input, paying for the outputs. What you need to do is pay for kids to actually learn. And that's a kind of shift in the way governments need to think about how they do development, stop paying for outputs, which also tends to benefit uh, contractors in the industry, uh, and pay for outcomes as well. So that, I'm glad you mentioned it, that, because it's massively important. It also allows for creativity, because the government yeah. can be uh, in a situation of being clear about the, the what, but more flexible on the how, mm -hmm. to say, this is the goal that we have. We want kids that graduate and are, you know, in the United States, career and college ready, uh, but we're going to be more flexible and l allow for experimentation about how to achieve that goal. Although it brings up another question, um, which relates to what you're initially asking about, of the data quality and the ability to measure some of these outcomes, which can be very challenging. And I think in general, there's an interesting divide between the quality of data that sort of um, policymakers uh, have and are used to using mm -hmm. and the quality of data and analysis that academics expect in their research. And one thing, so I, I find this very entertaining sometimes because if you put an academic uh, in front of, say, a parliamentary 
panel, and the parliamentarians ask a lot of questions to the academic. A responsible, good academic almost always answers, ooh, I don't know the answer to that question, or ah, that's a really interesting question, and it could go either way. Or more um, research is needed. Oh, God. Or, right, exactly. <laughs> um, that's always recommendation yeah. number one. <laughs> And this is, I mean, it's just responsible research to be really clear about your uncertainty, but it's also something that isn't necessarily mm, as constructive as possible for the policymakers. Yeah. I think this is especially hard for effective altruists because we have this really core value. Being uncertain and being honest about our level of confidence about different things and looking for disconfirming evidence for the things that we believe are true um, and I have not yet found a great way to square this circle of having those values, but also being useful to policy. Ultimately needs to make a call, and it's all well and good for them to hear, oh, well, it could go either way, but they need to know which way should they assume it's going to go when they're planning. And you also get a sort of a unilateralist's curse situation going on where the irresponsible who are not reflecting their uncertainty end up being the ones who are listened to because they're providing useful information about what's actually going to happen in the future, mm. even if we don't actually know. Mm. And well-designed policy should be an iterative process. So you can't, you, we can't go to policymakers and say, here you go, there's the answer, right. solved it for you. And they go, thank goodness for that. They implement it and they go off on holiday. That doesn't work like that. You have to make sure that they buy into the notion that this is a great start. It, solves, it seems to solve some issues, some, answer some questions, but we need to be monitoring and evaluating all the time so that we can iterate and make the policy better all the time. So it's an ongoing learning process. One of the things effective altruists, though, could do is I think that there are some, um, some principles associated with evidence-based policy uh, that people in the EA community could get behind. So, for example, uh, the notion that you shouldn't spend a lot of money on something in, unless you've tested it at a smaller scale, or the notion that uh, you should have an effort uh, to make it easy to, to find out which interventions have actually been rigorously evaluated, or sort of where are they on the continuum from speculative to promising to, you know, evaluated with multi-site RCTs and longitudinal data, uh, or the notion of, as some agencies have done, is to actually have a chief evaluation officer or paying for outcomes as opposed, as opposed to paying for inputs. So I think that EA could get behind the notion of uh, what could an agency do today so that future policymakers, 5, 10, 20 years from now, uh, would be in a better position uh, to make decisions that are informed by evidence as, as opposed to relying more on intuition. Now, I, would, I want to chime in to give a, a perspective from a, an agency that we don't, have, we don't fund science. Um, we're not going to be implementing programs, per se, in the way that Tom does. And so our use of evidence and rigorous analysis happens a little bit differently when we go into a conversation about technology innovation with our leadership. I mean, what I, what my office does and, and those who work in that office is we're scanning because we're looking for trends and issues that could cause political problems or change the way that we might have a relationship with another country change the way that we conduct our diplomatic activities so we're doing really high level sort of i would say even a little foresight kind of thing and we then take a really broad, cross-cutting um, look at an issue and write a one-page memo, 14-point font, and we send that up our leadership chain and see in, the, in that one-page memo, you've got to get it in there. Like, what is it? What is quantum computing? Why does it matter? Mostly, like, what is going to be the of this? How might this change labor um, forces? How, what are the enabling technologies that are driving this um, change? Who are the key players? Which other countries are in this space that we might want to be aware of? What's happening in the international arena? Are any 
conventions or multilateral institutions picking this issue up? Are we going to be negotiating on this anytime soon? And then basically saying, if you want more issue, if we've persuaded you that this has implications for foreign policy or, or the way that you as senior leadership are, uh, you know, will this come up with conversations that senior leaders might start having with each other, um, with other countries, then well, it comes back down. If they're talking to Justin Trudeau, he's going to yeah. be telling them about superposition. Oh, I, oh, I <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> I watched that video and then I was like, okay, I'm going to write this down. He got it. He nailed it. Mm -hmm. um, so then if there, if there is a, a query that comes down and is like, yes, we want to know more, then we start pulling in the experts. And recently we did this with the, something called an Innovation Forum, which was launched by Secretary Kerry last year. And that is where we bring in um, members of the leaders, technologists, and we have a, we let them have a conversation in front of the leadership where they can basically trot out the evidence for why something's going to matter and sort of ground truth it with our leadership listening to the variety of viewpoints there. Because what's going to happen is because we're not pro and creating programs like, um, like Tom Shop is, is that the State Department will go into interagency conversations where really high level things like gene editing will come up and there will be a discussion about what is the United States government going to say about gene editing. And from the State Department's point of view, what we bring in or what our leaders bring in is um, a grounded understanding of the variety of viewpoints on what's happening in a technological space and say, as we are talking about all the different activities that the various parts of the U.S. government could do, or the way a policy should be formulated. Okay, so let's think about the international implications of changing our regulatory system. Let's think about the trade implications if we start to um, take certain types of applications off the table, those kinds of things. So the evidence for us comes a little bit later when we have caught the attention of our leadership and made the case for why something is going to matter in a diplomatic space. And then we start to pull in the community. That's amazing. So I'm struck by how much we've kind of talked about process and learning and improving and not much really at all about, again, these, you know, very specific things, right? Malaria nets, that's the number one thing. Like, let's just flood the, you know, the continent with the malaria nets. Um, I think that might come as a surprise to a lot of people listening who sort of think of the work of government as making decisions and, you know, then they're kind of off and may, you know, revisit it or may be revisited only, you know, 20 years later. Is your perception that government really has moved toward this more iterative approach? Or where do you think we are in the process of getting to where we need to be in terms of a government that learns and, and improves over time? Still very early days. Yeah, so there's going on relative to where we were, but it's from a low base. Uh, and, a, you know, I don't want to, uh, so a lot of what we work on, or a lot of, for example, a lot of what the members of my team work on is very specific things. So, as I said, you know, uh, uh, what can, can the United States pers uh, pursue to advance commercial space? Uh, the President's Brain Initiative, which is about dramatically increasing understanding of how the brain encodes and processes information. How can we get more young people uh, excited about science, technology, engineering, and, and math? How do we make it easier for high-skill immigrants to come to the United States? How do we create an environment that is easier for uh, uh, emerging growth companies to raise capital and go public? Uh, so a lot of what we work on is our very like specific uh, challenges or opportunities, and then again we're trying to, to say what would move the ball forward. Is this going to require legislation? Are there important things that uh, the executive branch can do with existing le uh, legislative authority? Is this an area that needs more funding? Uh, does the government need to be recruiting different types of people to come and work at the which we've done in the, in the technology area? Is there an opportunity for the president to use his bully pulpit and his convening ability to build a broader coalition that not only includes the government, but private sector and civil society? But I'd also notice that 
we have a panel here of mostly uh, technology and development interested people. And those fields change very rapidly compared to other aspects of what governments look at. So we might expect the people sitting on this panel to think more about processes that are able to be adaptive as situations change than necessarily the rest of the government. So it may be, I mean, absolutely, there's a long way to go, but also we might expect to be sampling from those who have already gone quite far in that process. So Tom, do you think that this mentality has been adopted or sort of pushed down, if you will, into many different areas of government, or is it still something that's sort of sitting at the executive, the highest executive level, and needs to be kind of disseminated throughout the broad reaches of government still? Yeah, no, there's a lot r more room for, uh, for adoption of this. So, you know, the percentage of uh, grant making that the federal government is doing that is using the approach we talked about of this tiered evidence uh, experiment validate scale approach, for example, uh, is still relatively small compared to the amount of, uh, you know, total spending that the federal government does. Um, in, on the good news front, there was bipartisan supported by Patty Murray, who is a Democrat in the Senate, uh, and Paul Ryan, Republican uh, Speaker of the House, uh, to create a commission on evidence-based policy uh, that is looking at uh, how you can, how the government can make more data available that will lower the cost of researchers doing rigorous evaluations. Um, and so one of the things that has been holding this back is that doing one of these randomized controlled trials is actually pretty expensive. Um, and there are some ideas about how you make so-called administrative data available to the researchers that still preserve privacy and, and confidentiality. Uh, and so I think this could really help move the needle uh, and is evidence uh, that there is bipartisan support for the notion of uh, a government that does more of what works and, and less of what doesn't. Yeah, that would certainly be an incredible thing to see take uh, root over time. The so, scientific method, it's a yeah, good thing. Yeah, it, it's, uh, as Julia said yesterday, <laughs> it's the worst way to figure things out, except for all the others that have <laughs> been tried. So, one phrase that kind of comes up a lot when you're talking about policy is this concept of political will. And I think, for me, that's sort of a, obviously it's an abstract concept. I think for a lot of people in the audience, it's kind of a, a hard to get your arms around. Maybe you guys could each kind of reflect on that from your different perspectives. What is political will? How do we build it? And for things that aren't top of mind, others, and certainly you know, anything that the government is going to do is going to involve a lot of others getting involved and touching it at some point. How do we create and focus that political will and actually make things happen? I, I will take a crack at that. So, um, so there's a couple things. What, that there are a limited number of things that the uh, president and his or her senior advisors can focus on at any given point, right? So that there's not like an, uh, if, er if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. So that's, that's one thing. It's like, is there an issue that you think is really important that is like down there in terms of the, uh, the uh, you know, priorities and, and needs to be elevated uh, because of its importance? So I think that's one dimension. Uh, I think the other thing is that there are certainly policy issues that r require difficult trade-offs. Uh, you know, climate change is a good example. Uh, there are some things that we need to be doing now uh, to reduce the risks of climate change in the future. Uh, and it, it's difficult for any political system uh, to make those types of trade-offs. I'm, go I'm going to do something that is hard today uh, in exchange for, uh, you know, benefits that are going to materialize in like 2040, 2050, and for which there is organized opposition. Uh, so th those are some of the things that, uh, that's, that a political leader in saying, uh, I don't care that we're not going to uh, see the benefits right away, and I don't care that there's, there's going to be you know, opposition to this. I think this is important so that I'm willing to devote 
time and energy and political capital to solving this problem. So that, that's sort of what I, when so, it's someone's will, that's the type of thing that I think about. Yeah, and I think on our, on, on our front, we are always cognizant of administration priorities and what the most salient issues are in the minds of our leadership. And, you know, the issues that we work on are change, but the way we talk about them and frame them so that they hook on to the things that we know are priorities for our government will change. So in our office, we do spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, so we know that um, we know that this administration, one of the big uh, policy priorities for Secretary Kerry is oceans and ocean, ocean conservation. So um, we know that within the State Department, there's a Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science, and they have their hands full with a number of ocean summits and, you know, sort of getting together partnerships around ocean conservation. We, so we know that in that space, there's a lot of people already working on that issue within the building. We're not going to go there, right? So we're going to pick the areas where we see these that are, or issues that nobody else has really picked up and then try to hang those on um, existing priorities. We also try to see what's coming that may cause problems. So an example of this would be the Zika virus. And we, in our office, were, we started to see news feeds come through, and we started to see a couple cables from our embassy in Brazil saying there's something happening here on the ground. And then when we saw the New York Times article with the picture of the child, the infant, with, um, with a, 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 a misshapen head, we thought, this is, this, there's science here, but this is going to be a problem. This wasn't really a priority on anybody's radar at that time, but we knew um, this, the, the perception of what's happening and the, the way that that image is going to grab the public, this is going to be a problem, and that this issue might be moving out across countries. The vector, if we get that link sorted out, the vector is across countries, probably in the United States. So we immediately said, we, they're probably not thinking about this upstairs. Let's write a memo on what we know about it and start talking to other parts of the department who have responsibilities for global health pandemics and responses. See if they're tapping into the interagency, other agencies who are probably hearing the same thing that we're seeing in the news. See if they're starting to work this issue and work to leadership, something's coming. There's a scientific component to this but there's going to be a whole bundle of other issues if this really turns out to be what we think might have might be there. Can, can I ask you a question? So it became an issue that your leadership wanted to act upon after it was on the, in the New York Times, even though your office knew about it beforehand. What's the process? There are a lot of things in the New York Times. So <laughs> again, it goes to back to that screening process that we do that's not... Um, you, you do, this may sound a little, um, for, for, for those who like driven decision making, there's a lot of sort of gut check reality that goes into this and just being able to recognize, I see something here that has different facets around it. And yeah, it was in the New York Times. I'm, I can't say that our leadership had or had not read that article, but we is, have to say, Okay, from our perspective, we think this is going to explode because of these reasons. And if they haven't already connected the dots upstairs, I just say upstairs, um, we have seven <laughs> floors of this building. Um, they're up there, we're in the middle. Um, we, <laughs> that's our job, to, is to, to put it up and say, we think this is coming, this is your science advisor's office speaking. We've talked to other parts of the building who, who are familiar with pandemics. They went through Ebola. We had just finished dealing with that. Um, potentially, we have another kind of situation like that. It's up to you to decide how you want to respond to this, but our job is to keep that conversation going. And I think that's a really important point because I think it just shows that the uh, publicity can actually help build political will behind an issue and create uh, a policy opening 
say for organizations like ours, if we've worked on something, it's quite possible it will lay dormant for many years because there is not the political will to enact the opportunity to enact it. But certain things happen in the real world and suddenly people become more interested in the issue and through my team and communications and policy outreach, our job is to make sure that we get our ideas out there. Mm -hmm. And so when the time is right, people can say, oh, that's interesting. Let right. me learn a little bit more about that. And we'll pick up the phone and call because then we have to Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, in political science, this is known as a policy window. Mm -hmm. So there's this notion that a policy window will open. And then if at that point uh, you have an idea, that's sort of the right time to act. So let me give you one concrete example of this. So um, prior to the Ebola, uh, I had been interacting with uh, researchers at, at DARPA, program managers at, at DARPA, who had ideas for uh, being able to dramatically reduce the time required f to go from bug to drug, and also to do so in a, in a way that was a platform technology. So as opposed to, oh, every time you have a new pathogen, you're going to have to come up with a totally new process for making a vaccine, that you would have a, a methodology and a set of approaches that you could use uh, in a wide range of emerging infectious diseases. Um, and so when the Ebola outbreak occurred, um, uh, I knew that they had started to work on Ebola and that uh, the development of these technologies would have benefits not only for Ebola, but any other you know, global public health emergency in, in the future. Um, so in that environment where the Congress said, yes, we're going to spend some additional funding in this area as, as part of the response to that, uh, we were able to get some more funding for this so that not only is it, is it good for Ebola, but also uh, could also hopefully improve our ability to respond to future pandemics. But I think this is, so this highlights, um, I think, a problem with the way our government handle disaster prevention is that funding availability for various kinds of potential disasters is often quite crisis dependent and often bodies will decide to fund immediately after a crisis. And sometimes it's possible for a sort of organization to save up their and spend it down slowly until the next crisis. But sometimes you just need to shove a billion dollars out the door in a year and then be chronically underfunded until the next crisis hits. This is really damaging because often prevention and mitigation work is more cost effective than recovery work. You know, often people have already been killed. Um, after the crisis, and it's sort of pointless to shove money out the door then. I don't know what the systemic fix to this is, because partly it just requires a mindset change um, in the bodies that allocate the funding, or possibly among the electorate, but I think it's a really significant issue. Um, that of how these, the moments, the political windows, are often very events-driven, rather than being consistent. Th that's actually a really good example of an opening for an organization like mine to work on. And we're actually just starting a program of work looking at you can make countries more prepared for natural disasters. That will inevitably happen now in greater frequency. Uh, because you start from the, the, the problem, which is exactly that funding for humanitarian response is done post the uh, current, post the event, post the earthquake, then donors go, oh, let's, let's give some money to this. And what do we need? What's the appeal? And appeals always end up underfunded. So we're starting to now look at it from the economics point of view, from the finance point of view. How can you better prepare? How can you maybe like bring Like insurance. In... Exactly. That's yeah. what we're working yeah. on, disaster yeah. risk insurance. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting to think, okay, can we bring different players who have an interest in this field together to try and find a solution to this very important and future-facing real-world problem. And there are some promising avenues on this with parametric insurance and other approaches to, to disaster relief. Oh, I'm going to send you our framing paper. <laughs> so I've, I've already read it. It's very oh, good. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, there's definitely more that needs to be done there. So can, I know we're wrapping up, but can I just make a point that, um, uh, about why policy is really important for EAs to think about? And it goes back to something uh, that Jenya was talking about, about um, the publicity that point we're talking about publicity. So when I was a job as a journalist was to tell the story of the world as it is, to expose the problems. And then as a journalist, you go, okay, I've done my job. Now someone else go and sort it out. 
you, in a way, absolve yourself of the responsibility of finding the solution because you've done your part, which is to identify the problem. And in the process of identifying the problem is the first vital step. So the next step is perhaps what I'm doing now at the Center for Global Development. We are looking at the problems and we're designing solutions, coming up with the ideas that could solve those problems. And then people further down the panel and further down the chain are the ones who implement those ideas and actually put them, roll them out in the field. So it's all about, we all sit on this kind of process of change, but just given my background, that's one really interesting difference that I've seen. I've gone from the person who asks the questions to being someone involved in trying to find the answers. And that's something where I think EAs can really make a big difference in the future as well. And I urge more of you to this panel next year. And there should be more panels on policy at this conference. So we are just about out of time, but I wanted to ask each of you for a, maybe a closing thought and kind of building on your comment there for a little bit of advice for, let's say, a hypothetical person who has an altruistic idea, and let's say that they're, you know, they're willing to be completely self-ownership of the idea. They don't need credit for the idea, but they've got maybe the next bed nets, right? Something that is really going to be dramatically cost-effective and, and could be truly scalable, but they're kind of coming out of the garage with it now, right? And, and they've been you know, focused on this issue and this problem, and they, they now feel that they have a solution that they want to try to take somewhere. Where would they go? Where, who should they talk to? And how, how would you advise that person to get started in, you know, as an outsider, coming to government or coming to the, the, the broader policy apparatus and trying to get some support to make something like that real? Yeah, I, I would say you know, to try to identify someone in their social network who uh, has a little bit of understanding about how the government works, uh, because I think it, it can be uh, murky from the outside, it can be opaque. Uh, and so trying to identify someone in your social network that has uh, you know, worked uh, in the government before, whether it's in the Congress or the executive branch, or is it a think tank uh, you know, so a, an organization like the Center for Global Development has a lot of people who are former government officials. So they both have the sort of institutional understanding about how the government works. Also, they're uh, able to speak more freely. They're not subject to all the constraints that someone who is currently serving is, is subject to. Any other thoughts for an aspiring EA with a, a promising idea? I, I have something that I would like to highlight, and this is, I would encourage those who are interested in learning more about policy, the packaging of ideas and is really important, and the packaging of ideas often hinges around how do we link it to political priorities, and it's really hard to understand that without getting some experience in a political Landscape. And so I would encourage you, I, I, at, the mid, at the beginning I mentioned I run four fellowship programs within the State Department that bring in scientists and engineers, PhD level scientists and engineers into the government to spend one to two years working and understanding the policy processes. It can be, um, it can be within domestic agencies, it can be within foreign agencies. They're the AAAS, Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Programs. Professional societies often send their um, young, younger uh, members to D.C. to spend time embedded in these agencies. Um, tenured faculty, we have a program to bring them in to SAID for a year. I would really encourage you, in order to better understand how what you work on is more relevant or is relevant to the political landscape, to consider coming and spending a year or two inside the machinery and learning and contributing to this, and then going back to your community and sharing those, those lessons. So I have a, a young person on my team, Maya Shankar, uh, who sent me an email out of the blue uh, saying, Cass Sunstein says I should work for you. Uh, he's gonna be a speaker later this afternoon. Uh, and in a very short she created something called the Social and Behavioral Sciences Team she recruited 20 behavioral scientists to the federal government. She now has a waiting list of over 500 uh, that want to join the team. Uh, she convinced President Obama to sign an executive order institutionalizing this. And uh, she uh, now has over 60 collaborations with uh, different federal departments and agencies who are committed to using insights from the social and behavioral sciences and actually rigorously evaluate them to make sure that they work. So, 
individuals uh, can have, you know, the government seems very large, but at the end of the day, it's not buildings that do things. It's uh, and uh, a single individual who is hardworking and intrinsically motivated and entrepreneurial and knows how to work with other people can get an amazing amount of stuff done in a short period of time, despite what you read in the press. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you to all of our panelists, Jenya, Seb, Tom, and Rajesh. Great to have you here, and we appreciate it. Also, look for them hopefully this afternoon in the Pauly West Ballroom for a little informal q and I hope you guys will have a chance to go over there and, and meet some of our attendees. I'd also just say that the Center for Effective Altruism is thinking about expanding its policy work and fantastic people to come and join us. Um, so you should at least come have a conversation with me if that's something you're interested in discussing or thinking about. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.